descriptive ethics and you also have descriptive ethics where we're saying, you know, this is the way the world is, this is the way we relate to the ideas. And, um, you know, notionally it's, it's sort of descriptive where you're just describing what happens rather than making judgment, but that does sort of leak in a bit as well. And it's obvious, obviously a, a bit of a, a leakage with um, psychology. And one of the things you can ask people, um, you know, what, it, it, was it reasonable to, for a captain to flog people on his ship a few hundred years ago when that was the only way to maintain discipline? And if you didn't do that, you know, basically people wouldn't do anything or you'd have a mutiny or whatever. And some people will say, well, it was reasonable to do that back then, but it's not reasonable to do so now. So we don't, so one of the things that philosophers search for is universal principles. And you can say, well, hey, that's letting us know that there aren't really universal principles, but a universal principle might well be to do what you can in the, in the circumstances, to be as humane as you can in the circumstances, and a few hundred years ago you were quite limited in that. Now, um, we also have emotions running around in us. Now, one, emotions are like desires, goals, ambitions, and we lead our life and we sort of navigate our way through. But there's some things that are, that are a lot stronger than that, like basically not to commit violence, not to murder, or for parents to sort of like, you know, nurture their children and make sacrifices in pursuit of what happens there. And those feelings are normally a much stronger feeling. And, you know, that's, that's the emotional drive of these things that we must all do. Having said that, obviously some parents are not terribly good parents, but we still see statistically these much stronger feelings, um, you know, the, the obligations that we have are actually shared and there's a much stronger emotion riding with them. Now, um, you also have uh, guilt. Now, basically, obviously, if you do something wrong, there's guilt, but some people actually say that anticipated guilt is a strong driving force. And there's a bit of debate over, is the feeling of anticipated guilt or is it just a version of something bad that might happen? But if you think, talk to a few people, they might say, I couldn't do this because I couldn't live from with myself afterwards. Now, what's that describing? Maybe it's describing anticipated guilt. I don't want to feel guilty after the event, and I'm sort of avoiding it in adva advance. So, now, another thing is that a lot, sometimes people feel this disgust or, or, or sort of feel very uncomfortable about something, and then when you ask them for details, um, you know, it's just something that you rationalise after event, the event. So the feeling comes first, and then you actually stumble to sort of articulate why something is wrong. Um, and that, that's a problem there. Now, there's also something called the trolley problem. Is anybody aware of that one? It sort of has an American origin. Um, that's this idea that if you have what I guess the Americans call a trolley, I guess we'd call it a tram, it's sort of careering down the tracks. The track that it's on will kill five people, but if you push a lever, you'll put it onto a different track and it'll kill one person. Now, um, basically, that's something where you ask a lot of people, is that a reasonable thing to do? And most people say, yes, you can push the lever and sort of basically kill one person rather than five. And the other interesting thing is, not only have they asked these questions, they've done neurological studies on people and seen how their brains light up, so it's an interesting thing to do. But the other interesting thing is, regardless of whether you're an atheist or a Christian, you respond to this issue in more or less the same way. So there's a way we relate to ethics which is uh, shared by a lot of us. Now, between atheists and Christians, you know, some of them will uh, vary a lot on you know, abortion and voluntary euthanasia and so on, but there are also some I areas where we have a lot in common. But the other thing is if you take that trolley problem and imagine that you're going to push someone off a bridge and they'll then fall in front of the tram and stop it so that the four, five people don't get killed, Right. The interesting thing is, while people are willing to push the lever um, to, to sort of kill that one person, in a sense, some of the logical structure of this problem is the same. You're still killing someone to save five lives, but people don't normally, very few people are actually willing to say that they'll push that person off the bridge. And, you know, some people theorise that we do actually have a definite aversion to physical violence that's built into us. I mean, certainly. I mean, if you run around the nightclubs, you'll, you'll, you'll sort of scratch your head over if, if, if there's, there's, there's some sort of evolved in aversion to violence. But it's certainly one of the things out there. Relative to pushing levers in the abstract, we have an aversion to violence, and that's sort of built in, and that's, um, that's something that goes, that goes on there.
Yeah. Well, I think the sentiment is these things are done in the abstract. I mean, if you know something about the people, you might say that, you know, that one person is a Nobel Prize winner or cancer researcher that may well save thousands of lives if you let them continue living. But these stories are written in the abstract in terms of you don't know these details. Well, that's, that's just it. I would still say if you don't know who they are, that's the decisions that you're making. But this is, these are the ideas in, in philosophy. I mean, you know, I suppose you can sort of say that, that, you, that you know better than all the philosophers in the world, but there's quite a lot of agreement on these ideas. And who knows, maybe all the philosophers are wrong, you know? Yes. Well, I would say this is an introduction and you're welcome to do all the research you like on them. You can read it up on the trolley problem. You'll, you'll find lots of information on the web without really trying, I can tell you. Um, a last thing that I'll mention is uh, evolution. And, you know, I, I've actually speculated that some of these things were perhaps evolved in to assist in our survival. And one of the things that some people talk about is, you know, you can actually look at evolution and say, you know, there's a, a degree of cooperation that's built into us. So, well, that means we ought to cooperate and we all ought to all get along. And that's actually a problematic argument, because while you can actually argue that we have a certain degree of cooperation evolved into us, and that's true, but the sentiment is much more we have an obligation to reciprocate rather than an obligation to be generous. Sure, we're a bit generous, but if someone does her a favour, we're much strongly obliged to reciprocate rather than, you know, sort of put ourselves out in the first instance. Obviously, we do to some extent, and, you know, there is an encouragement to do that. But equally, we can also look at evolution and say, we're also evolved to form in-groups and out-groups. We're also evolved to declare that the out-group is subhuman and um, basically uh, devalue some people. So we, so we recognise some people as uh, you know, individuals of ethical and functional equality, but we also seem to be evolved into to, um, downgrade that for a lot of people. Like we can imagine... A, a US slave owner, you know, before the Civil War, who's one of the best gentlemen, very nice to all his fellow slave owners, and perhaps even people who don't own slaves but are basically free, but is nevertheless quite brutal to his, to his slaves. And that sort of thing is consistent with evolution because there's an element of evolution which says we are, we, we do bind ourselves together, we form an outgroup, and we're actually willing to be violent to the outgroup. And that's something that we're evolved for, just as we're also evolved to cooperate and reciprocate and so on. So you can't actually say that evolution actually licenses something to be good or bad. And that's one of the things about evolution. Where a lot of our behaviour is actually influenced by evolution. You can learn a lot from that, but it's difficult to say that this is the right thing to do because evolution is it's a sort of taking us in that direction. So, um, how have I gone there? That's okay. All right. Well, I'll bring my main main part of my talk to an to an end now. But uh, if there's there's questions or discussions, please, please feel free. So. Ah, yes, you, you, you could say what you might call tribalism, um, you know, sports teams, you know, all that sort of stuff. I mean, okay, I don't know my way all around the, evolu the evolutionary thing, but you could say that's, that there's a lot of that behaviour that's evolved into us, you know, forming of tribes, forming of groups yeah. and so on. And I guess that includes computer users. Well, look, I think that when people see a logo, particularly when you have a, a small group, mm. uh, and they see a logo that represents that group, <laughs> okay, now, um, if you were walking through a, a, a university lobby, sat down at a table, looked up, and the person next to you had a machine that had a, had a Linux logo on it, you would be more likely to talk to them. Certainly be more likely, because you would think there's got some commonality with them. Well, I think... I, it, 
Well, there, there, there's, there's, a, there's a tribal element and a pragmatic element in that it's easier to start up a conversation if you can already see something you have in common. So there's a tribal element and a pragmatic element yeah. there, I would yeah. suggest. So. Well, I, th I think, think that sort of branding writ large, and Apple are not the only people to commit no, no, that you sin, that. you know. But you know, car, cars, and so on. Yeah. Nike shoes, I yeah, yeah. And, and, and school children were mugging each other for the Nike shoes. Does anyone remember those episodes? Anyway, yeah. No, I, I, well, trying to, trying to engage with that comment, I think there's nothing wrong with Apple users feeling happy so long as they don't feel superior, all right? So long as, all right? So, but basically, there's nothing wrong with a group of people feeling happy because you are actually increasing the net happiness in the world. If that happiness is at the cost of some tension or some conflict or something like that, then okay, that's a problem. Um, but in broad terms, there's nothing wrong with more people feeling happy. So, so. Actually, very much. Just happiness is a subjective thing. So someone might feel happy. Oh, look, I'm killing all these people. I feel so happy. But, but um, you just said that. Just, that's what we're behaving. I'm not. Yes, that's right. I did say that. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, I said as long as, as long as the happiness is not at the course of tension or some other problems that arise from it. So, you know, I mean, I think that is a reasonably consistent way of looking at it. In other words, um, you know, it, it's, it's fine for Apple users to be happy. It's, it's a problem if, if the world's getting more tribalistic as a result of that. I think humans talk about the majority of people. Mm. But, but I, my, my understanding is that Peter Singer is not an unadulterated utilitarian. He does sort of say, well, we've got to have two levels here. We also have to have a rules-based level where, you know, basically, um, you know, basically we don't endorse the happiness of some psychopath killing lots of people, you know, the, or, 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 or we don't decide to sort of harvest the organs of a person wandering into the hospital because of all the lives that will be saved. You know, you don't, don't want to do that. <laughs> I think we'll have to agree to disagree on that matter. Oh well. Well, you certainly have your point of view, and I hope you can make your own way in the ethical world and be informed by these ideas. And if they don't make a difference to you, well, never mind, I tried. <laughs> Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. And you all need to come next month for the GNU Linux interpretation. Right. Well, I will eventually turn up to give another half of this talk, but I do alternate this with uh, oh, the, the, the cycling group, the um, critical mass cycling group, but also I'm